All right, welcome everyone. My name is Kate McNamara. I'm very happy to welcome you to uh, the Mortaris Center book launch of Charles Kupchin's Isolationism, a history of America's efforts to shield itself from the world, which I in fact have a hard copy of, which is very exciting. Um, so uh, if Abe Newman, the director of Mortara, was able to be here today, he would certainly say that um, you know, book launches are absolutely one of the most wonderful things we do at Mortara, um, celebrating a colleagues, um, bringing a book to uh, us is, is a wonderful thing. I will say that Professor Kupchin has published many, many books in his time. Um, I'll mention a, a couple, No One's World, which sort of um, uh, was very prescient about the kind of rise of multipolarity, um, as well as how enemies become friends, which is a fascinating, uh, very kind of macro historical comparative study of the evolution in uh, adversaries and animosity to cooperation and uh, alliances, both wonderful books. And today he's bringing us another uh, very interesting and thought provoking book. I would say that um, Charlie, who's of course a professor of international affairs in the School of Foreign Service and in the uh, government department at Georgetown, um, is uh, really uh, admirable, I think, in, in many ways, in part because he's able to do such uh, sophisticated and important scholarship at the same time as he truly does bridge to uh, the policy world and really has had uh, a variety of quite important impacts on questions around uh, American foreign policy. Um, he's had a very important role in uh, the National Security Council, um, working uh, on transatlantic relationships and so on. And so it's really a pleasure uh, to have him uh, speak to us today. Um, we are going to have uh, Charlie speak for about 15 or so minutes, and then we're going to have some comments from Jamie Martin who is an assistant professor in the Department of History and the School of Service. Jamie, Jamie is a fantastic person to be commenting on this book because he's really one of the uh, foremost um, scholars working on questions of uh, global capitalism and um, questions around uh, the Western order and where it might be going. So we're gonna turn to, to Jamie, and then Charlie's going to have a minute or two to to sort of lob back any any questions or arguments that he might want to. Uh, then we'll open it up for questions uh, from the audience. So uh, just a couple of housekeeping announcements. Please remain muted during the presentation. Um, when we move to Q and A, uh, we will allow people to unmute themselves and ask questions. Please use the raise hand function in the participants um, uh, icon at the bottom of your screen and I will keep track of uh, questions and, and call on folks. The other thing is this uh, event is being recorded and will be shared on the Mortara website. Uh, so uh, without any further ado, let me turn things over to Charlie to tell us about his newest book. Thanks a lot, Kate. Uh, and thanks to you and Jamie and Abe for participating in the, in the conversation this afternoon. I'm gonna try to be as brief as possible so that we can spend most of the time in conversation. So what I'll do is just kind of hit a few of the top lines in the book uh, and, uh, and then quickly pass the baton to, to Jamie for some constructive criticism. Um, maybe it, it would be useful for me to, to tell you why I wrote this book, where it came from. And, uh, and it really does uh, start, the story in my mind starts in the 1990s when I began to notice that coverage of foreign affairs in print journalism, media journalism began to fall off a cliff. Uh, I served in the National Security Council during the first Clinton term and I saw President Clinton deeply reluctant to engage in, uh, in the, the Balkans despite the bloodshed there. Then you had the 94 midterms and Republicans and Democrats went in different directions on every issue under the sun, including foreign policy. And that's when I first began to think, huh, it might, might this era of robust, unstinting internationalism that we've been living through, might, might that be the aberration in American history rather than the norm, right? Then you get 9-11 and everybody starts focusing abroad again, particularly on Al-Qaeda and terrorism, but that, the wars uh, after 9-11 don't go so well. 
And then this kind of inward turn, the isolationist impulse, as I call it, starts reappearing uh, over the course of George W. Bush's term. Bipartisanship collapses even further. And so it's around 2011, 2012 that I say, you know what? I think it's, I think I better go back and, and, and do some research, think about what this country was like before 1941. Uh, and I'm guessing I speak for many in IR. J Jamie's going to be an exception here because he's a historian. But for people like myself and Kate and Dan Nexon, I see Abe's on the call. We know a lot about containment. We know a lot about the Marshall Plan. We know a lot about stuff that's happened uh, over the last 70, 80 years, because that's what we've lived through and what we were taught in grad school and what we debate. Uh, and when I started going back to American diplomatic history prior to Pearl Harbor, I, I have to say I, my head exploded. And I was like, what country am I, am I reading about? And that's because isolationism was to the American political discourse what internationalism is today. That is to say, it was the only game in town. And from 1789 to 1898, the US expanded abroad, uh, excuse me, domestically, that is across North America, ruthlessly avid international traders, but went no further than the Pacific coast. And there were many debates about taking over Cuba, Haiti, the Virgin Islands, Latin America, Hawaii, you name it. It was under consideration. And every time it came up, either Congress or the executive branch swatted it down. And the story I tell in the book is one in which this kind of commitment to going no further than the Pacific coast, to avoiding foreign entanglement, as George Washington counseled Americans in 1796, it really did carry the day. Uh, and I'll just give you one quick anecdote to give you a sense of, of how strong this instinct was, both the isolationist, but also the flip side of it, the unilateralist impulse in 1778, we were, to put it euphemistically, getting our butts kicked by the British. We were going to lose the war, probably. So the founders, against their better instinct, formed an alliance with the French. And the French came across the Atlantic with ships and arms and troops, and they turned the course in the, civil, in the, in the Revolutionary War. And we won, and we became an independent nation. In 1793, Britain and France went to war again. The King of France had George Washington on his speed dial. He calls George and he says, hey, George, remember that alliance we formed in 1778? Well, we're now in trouble. We're now fighting the British again. How many troops and how many ships are you going to send across the Atlantic? What did George Washington do? He hung up his cell phone and he issued the proclamation of neutrality in which he basically said to the French, good night and good luck, you're on your own. And it caused a huge political firestorm because the Federalists, on, uh, excuse me, the Republicans under Jefferson were, how could, you, how could you not stand by the French? And they said, you don't have the, the constitutional authority to do that, only the Senate can renege on a treaty. But nonetheless, when George Washington committed that act of infidelity in 1793, it was the last time that the United States had a military alliance with another country until after World War II. That just gives you some sense of how strong this aversion to foreign entanglement was. Now, one other insight I wanna offer just to get us going and it's, and it's counterintuitive, again, given what we have been living through over the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years, is that American exceptionalism for much of American history was a justification for staying out of the world, not for getting into the world. Americans basically said, to protect the integrity and sanctity of the American experiment, we need to keep the outside world at bay. Because if we don't, we will likely fall prey to tyranny. We will become an imperial power just like everyone else. Ambition abroad will come at the expense of liberty at home. And the American experiment was also racial 
in its orientation. That it was, that is to say, it was primarily for white people and in particular for white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. And one of the breaks on overseas expansion throughout the 19th century and again into the 20th century was a desire to avoid integrating into the union polities that were not populated by whites. And so there, there was this very strong sense that standing aloof from the world was needed to further the American experiment. That narrative begins to change in 1898 when McKinley and Teddy Roosevelt and Alfred Thayer Mahan and others say, listen, we've made it to the Pacific coast. The frontier has closed. If the United States is gonna continue the dynamism of his experiment, it needs to take it on the road. And that's really the beginning of an effort to export the American experiment. But Americans don't much like it because the country turns into an empire. The Spanish-American War saddled the United States with a military occupation of Cuba, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, the Philippines, Guam, Samoa, and the Wake Islands. And Americans said to themselves, wait a minute, you told us we were going abroad to fulfill manifest destiny and we've become an imperial power. And then Wilson learns the lesson uh, of McKinley's mistakes. And when he goes to World War I, it's all about idealism and saving the world for democracy. But Americans don't really like that either. And it was the rejection of this realist as well as this idealist shift in the narrative of exceptionalism that leads to the hardcore isolationism of the interwar era. And again, by isolationism, I'm referring to strategic entanglements, not commercial entanglements. It's important to distinguish that. The US was a trading nation from the get-go. So that brings me to uh, 41, and that's really the beginning of the era of liberal internationalism, when Roosevelt blends the realism of McKinley with the idealism of Roosevelt and Democrats and Republicans come together behind this merging of power and partnership. The conclusion of my book is uh, essentially saying that that era has run its course and that the heyday of this robust, unstinting American internationalism is now behind us. And we, be, and we see in Donald Trump, but also before Donald Trump, the reemergence of many of the aspects of American grand strategy that led us on an isolationist, unilateralist, protectionist, and racist course before. And when I see Trump's America First doctrine, which harkens back to the America First Committee of 1940, I don't see somebody who's completely a bolt from the blue. I see someone who has broken with the tradition that reigned from 41 through Barack Obama, but is very much in step of what came before. So what I argue in the last chapter of my book is that the United States can't go back to the isolationism of the previous era. The world is too interdependent, it's too globalized, too much of what we need to do in the world depends on international engagement and cooperation. On the other hand, we cannot continue with strategic overreach because if we do, we risk that overreach could turn into dangerous underreach as the American public tires of the commitments that it has been saddled with by its elected elite. I'm not a big fan of Donald Trump, but I think we have to harvest lessons from his presidency, one of which is that the United States needs to lighten its load abroad if it is to bring its commitments back into line with its means and purposes. So I call in the book for what I call a judicious retrenchment, which entails pulling out of the strategic periphery, going offshore in the Middle East, ending these land wars, which have produced very little good, but produced lots of dead people and cost $6 trillion, continue to hold in the core as the great power pacifier. But I am worried that right now, if you read foreign affairs or you read other magazines, people are calling for the US to go back to hemispheric isolation, to pull out of Europe, to pull out of East Asia. In my mind, that would to be to deny one of the key lessons of history. So what I'm hoping for uh, is that the book stimulates 
an important national debate about this issue and helps guide us to the middle ground between doing too much and doing too little. In my mind, the United States, the United States needs to step back, but not step away. Uh, and it seems to me that is one of the key tasks for the next president, especially given that we are living through a pandemic and an inward turn in the American electorate of a sort that we haven't seen since the 1930s. And we know too well what happened in the 1930s. Over to you, Jamie. Great, well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much first to Kate and Abe for inviting me to give this comment and to Jenna for organizing this panel, um, but most of all to Professor Kupchan for writing really what is quite a magisterial work of history. Um, it was a true pleasure to read. Um, and the book really performs quite a remarkable feat of offering both a new historical argument uh, that scholars like myself um, and policymakers will benefit from immensely. And I'm sure it will become the go-to history of US isolationism as this question really does return to the center of debate over the coming years. Um, so I'm a historian of the first half of the 20th century and of international efforts to govern the world economy in particular. So I was especially drawn to the portions of the book that deal with the era of the world wars. Um, and it was of course during uh, these years that the United States first embraced an outward looking foreign policy that moved away um, from the more nakedly imperialist practices of an earlier era. Um, so my one major question for the book is about the role of international organizations and what we might term global governance more broadly in the story that it tells about the conflict between isolationism and internationalism. And I wonder what the history of America's rather lukewarm embrace um, of such institutions might tell us about the future of US foreign policy. So the book brilliantly shows how at the end of the First World War, the almost messianic project of Wilsonianism was rejected when the US Senate repeatedly refused to allow the United States to join the League of Nations. Um, the 1920s did see a powerful form of what we might call privatized US diplomacy in Europe run by US banks and businesses. And the book really does an absolutely fantastic job of highlighting um, these episodes that sometimes do get forgotten about. But it was true that the US state generally remained aloof from these efforts and it never offered the kind of security guarantees that might have helped prevent another total war. Um, and of course, it was only in the 1940s that Washington committed to using US state power to superintend a liberal international order, one that many claim is imperiled today. Um, but getting to this point, as Professor Kupchan uh, argues convincingly, um, required overcoming some of the excesses of Wilsonianism, which appear to have cost over 100,000 American lives for what was widely seen as a pointless European war. Um, now, there was some tragic irony to this. Um, Wilson's suspicion of entanglement with the European alliance kept US forces aloof from the Anglo-French coalition when they began to arrive in Europe in 1917. And this itself all but guaranteed higher US casualties um, as US forces repeated mistakes made by the British and French during the early phases of the war on the Western Front. Um, I think this somewhat grim fact speaks to some of the larger tensions within Wilson himself. And it's perhaps even symbolic of something about US internationalism and a kind of attention within US internationalism writ large. Uh, so the book rightly describes how Wilson himself was never a true universalist. Uh, he was a segregationist at home, a believer in global racial hierarchies, and he never wanted his beloved League of Nations to admit any kind of principle of racial equality in its design, despite the efforts um, by some to ensure that it would. Uh, what was also true about Wilson was that while he was committed to a new outward looking America, he was also deeply suspicious of committing Washington to alliances with the Europeans or to any kind of post-war arrangements that would require real sacrifices of US policy autonomy. Um, and you can see this very clearly um, in the case of Wilson's approach to post-war European reconstruction. So US banks, of course, had financed the European war. US banks would be heavily involved um, in the 1920s in Europe. Um, but Wilson uh, during the war was profoundly reluctant to agree to economic partnerships with the allies that would give them any say over US policies. Um, the demands and the costs of the war did force the US into various ad hoc economic arrangements with the allies in 1918, but Wilson always regarded these with deep suspicion. And as soon as the war was over, he insisted the United States quit them altogether. Now, Lloyd George and the French and the Italians had something different in mind. 
they saw these wartime economic allied bodies as laying the foundation for a post-war international economic organization that could be used to reconstruct Europe and to contain Germany through a kind of system of economic sanctions. And this would have resulted in the, worst, the world's first peacetime international economic organization over two and a half decades before Bretton Woods. And this is a kind of a history um, that I go into a bit in my own work, but that is not very well remembered today. Um, and it's true that many of Wilson's aides and advisors and many members of the administration um, really wanted the US to commit to these European plans for a kind of post-war economic reconstruction organization. But Wilson himself would have none of it. Uh, he insisted the United States not commit to any kind of international economic body that would restrict America's freedom of action. Um, this was, of course, the moment at which the United States was to singularly shape the post-war settlement. Now, there is something, again, a bit of an irony to this decision. Um, U.S. internationalism on this view depended on not giving up any U.S. autonomy, on not being kind of coerced into European designs for the post-war. Um, at the same time, this decision was later held up as a kind of original sin of the interwar period. It was a moment when the United States appeared to have had the opportunity to create international institutions that might have prevented the World Depression, for example. Um, and even Wilson's proud biographer, Ray Standard Baker, um, offered a rare rebuke of Wilson for having given up prematurely this experiment in creating international economic bodies. Um, now, I think it's important to emphasize that Wilson's decision to refuse to commit to European reconstruction was, of course, not out of any isolationism on his part, right? Wilson was desperate for a League of Nations, as we all know, as well as for the global expansion of American commercial and financial power. But the problem with creating an international economic body was that this would place the US into the position of taking orders from needy um, European governments that were now heavily indebted to US banks, right? This would tie down Washington at the moment that a new and post-European world order could be created. And it would force US businesses into sacrificing profits and giving up global markets that they gained during the war. So Wilson, the arch internationalist, himself rejected plans for an international organization out of fears this would involve delegating real US powers to it. Now, as the book shows, things changed in the 1940s, of course, under the Roosevelt administration. Um, during the Second World War, the US state did commit to creating this kind of intergovernmental economic organization. And this, of course, was what led to the Bretton Woods Conference of 1944. So you might see Bretton Woods as a moment when the US finally realized that it had to commit to multilateralism in order to make the world stable and prosperous again. And in a certain sense, this was obviously true. Um, but even at Bretton Woods, the US government embraced a form of multilateralism that was designed to ensure the US never had to delegate real powers to it. Um, unlike the League of Nations and unlike the United Nations outside the Security Council, the IMF and the World Bank um, were designed to ensure that the US would always have the dominant voting share in them and it could, it could always effectively wield veto power over its major decisions. So this meant that Washington in a way could have its cake and eat it too, right? It could establish these powerful multilateral economic organizations that would not in practice require the United States to relinquish any real power to them um, or to allow foreign governments to have any real say in the shaping of US policy. So the lesson that had been learned from the First World War was not only that international organizations were vital to peace and prosperity and that the US kind of had to come out of isolationist retreat, um, but also that such organizations could be designed in ways that didn't threaten US autonomy. So even as US internationalism was on the rise, there remained a profound suspicion about international bodies that required the US to delegate powers to them over sensitive policy questions. And perhaps this was inevitable. Um, given the disproportionate nature of US global power um, after the First World War and certainly even more so after the second. Um, but I think it raises a question about where US internationalism might go today in a world that is much more multipolar, in a world in which the US probably isn't the same kind of hegemon it once was. Um, of course, the reputation of international organizations today is at an all time low. Uh, the Trump administration has threatened to pull out of not only the WHO, but also the WTO. Um, the IMF is criticized globally for its structural adjustment and conditional lending policies. Uh, the United Nations seems less powerful and less relevant than ever. 
And of course, the European Union has gone through a rather rough time recently. Um, at the same time, however, I do think there's also an increasing sense that the kind of global collective action problems of the 21st century will require some kind of new form of global governance or some kind of reinvigorated form of global governance as the world grows smaller, hotter, um, and more interdependent perhaps than ever before. Now, within the US context, it's unclear whether there's any enthusiasm for this project at all. It doesn't seem as though there is on the US right, um, certainly not in the kind of um, America first part of the US right. Um, but I wonder where this question stands on the left or on the center left. Um, I think Professor Kupchan argues very convincingly in his book that a period of US global retrenchment is coming, certainly when it comes to global military commitments. Um, but at the same time, Democrats have also promised a return to the Paris Climate Accords um, and other multilateral arrangements. And I wonder whether they might also attempt to redefine US internationalism more broadly, um, a kind of internationalism for a world that faces dangerous collective action problems, but in one in which the US is also not clearly not um, a hegemon anymore, at least not of the kind that it once might have been. So I think the question is whether the US might be expected to commit to the kind of global governance the world needs on questions like climate, even if this demands sacrifices of US policy autonomy and constraints on US private interests. And I think the history of US internationalism um, isn't particularly encouraging on, the question, on this question. Um, now, these are huge questions, of course, but this is a big book and it's a very important book. Um, and I think it's guaranteed to spark um, some of these kind of um, fascinating and really important policy discussions and really to bring the kind of historical depth and wisdom to them um, that they need. So thank you again for having me. This is great. Thanks very much, Jamie. Um, uh, please go ahead and use the raise hand function if you'd like to ask uh, Charlie a question. Um, in the meantime, because uh, no, one's, no one's done that quite yet, um, maybe we can uh, have Charlie answer Jamie's questions. Um, and I actually also do have something that I'd love to engage about. So first, Charlie, to uh, any of Jamie's points briefly. Sure. Uh, before I do that, let me give a quick shout out to two people on the call, Arjun Narotra and Adam Klein, both of whom used to be Georgetown undergrads, both of whom made legendary contributions to this book as my research assistant. So, Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Arjun. Uh, and thanks for joining today. Um, uh, Jamie, I, I want to um, thank you for shedding such important light on a major theme that runs through the book, but I think it's very really important to stress. And that is this kind of intermingling of the isolationist and the unilateralist impulse. Because going back to the very beginning, Right, going back to the 1780s and the 1790s, one of the reasons that there was a consensus across a polarized political spectrum in favor of non-entanglement, it wasn't just isolation. It wasn't just banking on natural security. It was to ensure that the United States did not hitch its wagon to anybody. Uh, for example, where did the Monroe Doctrine come from? The Monroe Doctrine was a response to an offer from the United Kingdom to team up with the United States to prevent the Spanish from reimposing colonies in the Western Hemisphere. And the idea of doing something in cooperation with Britain was so awful that Monroe said, well, I guess I'll just come up with something and we can do it on our own. Uh, and, and so the, the, there is this fear deep-seated fear, and you see it today, particularly on the Republican side of the House, about doing anything that could compromise America's sovereignty or the constitutional right of Congress and the president to have authority over foreign affairs. And I would remind everyone that the League of Nations crashed and burned more because of unilateralism than because of isolationism. Yes, there were what were called irreconcilables, hardcore libertarian nationalist isolationists that voted against the league. But the main block of Republicans that voted it down were internationalists led by Senator Arthur Vandenberg. Their main objection was not engagement in the world. It was a United States that would potentially sublimate its sovereignty to the will of an international body. 
So that's, I think it's, it's very important that you point that out. And I completely agree with you that this is front and center today. Uh, and just as a thought experiment, if you and Kate and I got in an Uber after this seminar and went down to Capitol Hill with the post-World War II settlement, the Bretton Woods, the United Nations, NATO, they would laugh us out of the house. There's no appetite for that kind of deep-seated liberal multilateralism that we saw in the, in the 1940s. And so it, it is a huge question moving forward. Given that we live in a globalized and interdependent world where we cannot solve climate change, cybersecurity, refugees, global health alone, are we gonna have the wherewithal to do it through teamwork? Uh, and my own hunch tells me that probably we will because not doing it is too crazy and self-destructive, but it's gonna be a different kind of teamwork, much more flexible much less based on treaties, which won't be able to make it through the Senate, much more based on coalitions of the willing and informal compacts, kind of like the Iran nuclear deal, uh, than what we saw during the, the heyday of liberal multilateralism. Thank you, and it's really helpful to sort of hear your, your speculation about uh, how we might be going forward. Um, if I can kick things off uh, in terms of the, the, the kind of questions, I'd like to push you a little bit on this notion of sort of setting aside the imperialist view of the US and focusing on its history in terms of isolationism. It seems that that does require, as you say, sort of setting aside um, the notion of economic entanglements and really focusing on the strategic side. And of course, as somebody who's you know, spent my career thinking about how politics and markets interact, you know, I'm a little uncomfortable with that. So I'd love to sort of hear you unpack a little bit more um, how you are thinking about this notion that, you know, if markets structure and are structured by power, shouldn't we actually include um, more attention to the role of the United States in terms of its commercial reach, um, both in the past and, and today? And perhaps your analysis is taking a somewhat narrow view that's you know, based on a more sort of traditional grand strategy sort of IR view, rather than thinking um, more in terms of you know, broader, we could talk about post-colonial approaches and so on as to how the international system is hierarchically structured. Um, and in the meantime, I actually do have a couple more questions. So why don't I add on, I'll go to William Chesney and then Abe Newman. Uh, so, William, please. Hi, Professor. Hey, Will. Um, so, my question was, we, we've talked a bit about Woodrow Wilson. We could talk about the Marshall Plan and NATO and stuff like that. But the, the narrative that comes into my outsider mind is that uh, internationalism is, is sort of American elites pulling common Americans kicking and screaming into the international sector um, against their will. Is, did, did you find that to be a, a good overarching narrative as you were putting this book together or does that not really fit? Okay, and Charlie, is it okay if I collect another, another question and then we can kind of keep the conversation going? So over to Abe Newman. Great, thanks Charlie for a great presentation uh, and also Jamie for great comments. This is, mine is kind of building on Kate's point um, in, in two different ways. So one is, is about the, the global threat environment. So I guess it's kind of a Dudney-like argument, you know, like, can we really be isolationist anymore, uh, particularly when a US-China relationship presents a global threat and that, that, you know, the threats are no longer ships coming from France or England, but that they're really could reach our shores very quickly. But then the second one is very much about Kate's, whereas power is so intimately tied to markets. And because markets are global, you know, is there a way that we can even think about isolationism anymore um, in the way that, that has often been a standard bearer of US politics? So uh, I'll stop there. Thanks. You want me to... Uh... Reply now? Yep, that's, that's the questions that we have for the moment. So okay. go ahead, Charlie, thanks. Um, 
uh, to, to Kate and to, and to Abe, uh, you know, I, in the very beginning of the book, define what I mean by isolationism as the readiness of the United States to take on strategic commitments outside the motherland. And you can agree or you can disagree with that definition. Uh, so it really is a, a, a one that about geopolitics. And I, and I deal you know, frontally with the issue of commercial engagement. And, and you know, with George Washington, who said, the great rule of conduct for us is commercial relations with everyone, political connections with no one, to paraphrase. And over the course of the 19th century and, and even before in the 18th century, the United States did use its force on many occasions to defend its international trading interests. The Barbary pirates, various squadrons, Africa, East Asia, they, they were very active, but they didn't stay. They weren't interested in becoming a strategic presence. They were interested in defending Americans who were making money, period. And then they went home or they went to the next place where an American was threatened. And that's just, that's a very different account. And I would say one thing further, in the minds of the founders, and I would say this applies today as well, they saw geopolitical engagement as coming at the expense of commercial engagement. And that's in part because the experience of the United States during its early decades was that entanglement with Britain and France harms America's interest because they were interrupting transatlantic trade. And so they basically said, the less we have to do with them geopolitically, the better we will be economically. And so the idea that somehow we have to go out there and have 800 military bases to preserve international trade is something that I think needs to be questioned today in the same way that the founders questioned it back then. But yes, uh, we now live in a, in a very commercialized, globalized world. I personally think the notion of decoupling from China is not on, it's not going to happen. Uh, but I, I also think that we can continue that economic globalization without at the same time maintaining the current scope of our geopolitical engagement. Uh, to your question, Will, um, oh, and, and just one other quick comment on, uh, on this. Uh, you know, you said, Abe, that we have all of these threats and there's climate and, and, and pandemics and whatever. Yes, I, I, I agree with you, but I also think it's important to recognize that there is an alternative instinct. And that alternative instinct is if that outside world is as threatening as you say, then we should really hunker down. Keep in mind that we've closed our borders with Canada and Mexico during the pandemic. Foreign travel has fallen off a cliff. Yes, this is an extraordinary circumstance, but there still is an impulse in the country that says, if we don't get engaged in trouble abroad, trouble abroad will not come our way. Uh, and you hear many people saying that if we weren't in Afghanistan and Iraq, they wouldn't be coming after us. And uh, there is truth to that. Uh, to Will's point, you know, I, I think that certainly until 1941, yes, elites had to pull the American public kicking and screaming into geopolitical exertion abroad. In 19, 1898, there was an outburst of nationalism, of pro-war sentiment that dissipated very quickly after the insurgency broke out in the Philippines. When Woodrow Wilson went to the, uh, to the Senate and the House for a war declaration in April 1917, I don't remember the vote, but it was very lopsided. Everybody was sort of pro-war. That dissipated very quickly. In 1941, before Pearl Harbor, 80% of the American public was opposed to entry into World War II, in part because of the very effective lobbying campaign of the America First Committee. Different story after World War II, where you do see a real change in the way that the American public thinks about this issue. During the late 1940s, there was a, a period of fluidity in which the isolationists tried to make a comeback because of the Korean War and Truman's decision to deploy three divisions to Europe. 
but that kind of died out by about 53, 54. And I would say ever since then, you've seen a, a kind of public appetite for engagement wrapped in the American exceptionalist narrative. But as I said at the very beginning of my talk, I think that narrative doesn't wear so well anymore. And if you look at public opinion polls, three quarters of the public wants out of the Middle East. A recent poll by the Center for American Progress, a left-leaning think tank, found that 18% of the American public are liberal internationalists and that a majority are either America firsters or disengagers. Those are pretty sobering numbers. All right, thank you. Uh, Arjun, please go ahead and ask your question. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Kopchin, for speaking with us. I'm really excited to be here and to have uh, contributed to the book. So my question is on the role of history within the policymaking elites in other countries, right? I mean, the actions of the US in the Cold War in some sense have cast a long shadow and they continue to affect perceptions even today. And in India's case, the US involvement in the war with Bangladesh and bringing the USS enterprise to the Bay of Bengal has ramifications even decades on. And then more, more recently, every time the US wanted to reset with Russia, sometimes it seems like American policymakers forget that there is also history in many ways, good, bad, whatever, right? So my question is, to what extent should uh, people in foreign capitals be looking at a book like this and almost be bringing up certain points to US policymakers today? Like when they speak with folks in Washington, what should they be reminding them about their own history? Thank you. Shall I jump on that or you wanna get another one? Yeah, do we have any other questions at the moment or? That's a fascinating question. Why don't you answer that? I'm very curious about that. <laughs> um, so a good and, and, and complicated question, Arjun. Uh, you know, I think that right now there is a certain schizophrenia in perceptions of the United States in many parts of the world, where on the one hand, there is a continuing perception of the United States as an imperial power that does what it wants to, that is unilateralist, that doesn't accept the readiness of other countries, Russia, China, to India, to be a full partner, and that doesn't get the respect it deserves, to put it. You, uh, in kind of colloquial terms. And at the same time, there is growing unease that the United States has lost its way and that it doesn't really know its mind on foreign policy. And perhaps that this isolationist inclination that I write about in the book could be making a comeback. Uh, and as Kate knows, you kind of, you have on the one hand in Europe this, okay, well, we can't rely on the US anymore. So I guess we have to take destiny in our own hands and have strategic autonomy, as Merkel said a few years ago. On the other hand, the Europeans are desperate for Joe Biden to win so that you can kind of go back to a Europe that's tethered to the Atlantic space. I think in South Korea, in Japan, in Taiwan, there is a similar kind of questioning of whether the US can be counted on as a, as a reliable partner. Uh, and that, you know, the, 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 the history would give them reason to believe that they can continue to count on the American protector, but people are getting freaked out. People are watching what's going on here, the dysfunction in American politics, and asking, in my mind, legitimate questions. If I were a German or a Korean or a Japanese, I would be asking hard questions about what's going on in, in the United States today. And I do think that Americans and others need to know the broader history of the United States. Part of the reason I wrote this book is simply to tell the story. Uh, and that's partly because, as I said, for me, it was, Unbelievable. I, I, I was like, what country am I reading about? I don't recognize any of this. And then it dawned on me, well, this is my own country, but I think it was pretty damn different before 1941 than after 1941. And I think 
it behooves all of us to know that uh, and to do a better job of looking at who we are and where we are headed, not by studying Roosevelt and the Cold War, but by looking at the longer durée of American history. I'm guessing that Jamie won't disagree with me on that issue. Uh, and I think it's true of, of foreign countries as well. History matters. Absolutely. And I would say that, you know, I mean, IR is so guilty of sort of a presentist bias where we really don't sort of take that into account. And, you know, certainly, um, you know, as a, as a scholar of the EU, I've tried really hard to, to kind of put it in a long comparative setting. And, you know, since you mentioned the EU, it was interesting this morning, there was a piece by Stephen Erlanger in the New York Times, I don't know if you saw it, where he quoted uh, Natalie uh, Tocci talking about how, you know, exactly this, that actually the Europeans would like Biden to win, but on the other hand, another four years of Trump would be good for Europe because it would force them to actually, as she says in, in the quote, something like, you know, get their head out of the sand and actually move forward on this notion of strategic autonomy, yeah. um, which I really like because it's like, well, no matter what happens, you know, we can make something out of it. So that's a very positive way of thinking about things. But um, let, me just, let me make one other yeah. quick point on the history Please. as long as we're around this. Yeah. The other thing that really surprised me, and I'd be interested to get Jamie and Carol and other historians to say something about this is the degree to which, to the extent that I had knowledge about important events in American diplomatic history, uh, I had bad knowledge. You know, you, you sort of, we're taught that the Monroe Doctrine was this turning point at which the United States claimed hemispheric hegemony. No, it didn't. The Monroe Doctrine was a bunch of hot air. And, and a year or two after Monroe gave the speech about saying no more, no new colonies, he didn't say no colonies, he said no new colonies. Uh, he, uh, uh, um, Adams tried to send a delegation to Panama, a delegation of two people to a diplomatic conference in Panama. And Congress went nuts and said, no, we don't. We want nothing to do with diplomatic engagement outside our borders. Roosevelt, you know, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, this great wartime hero, this great leader, he was a hardcore isolationist throughout the 1930s. He was the guy leading the neutrality laws. He didn't take the country to war. Japan brought the, the war to the country. And so there are always these kind of inherited almost myths that, uh, that I had as part of my education that when I started reading the history myself, it's like, whoa, where did this come from? Well, we have some people who know uh, a lot about history, um, obviously Carol, but also Dan Nixon, whose you know, first book was, was a deeply historical look at um, changing types of international orders over time. So. Happy to have uh, either of them contribute in the last couple minutes that we have, or if anyone else would like to comment or ask a question. I'm in a different hemisphere. <laughs> uh, I know much about the Americas or even US history, but you know, this has been fascinating. Thank you, Charlie, very much for uh, bringing this to the fore. Thank you. I will try to say something because I'm raising my hand all the time and maybe because oh. I'm talking to Israel. So maybe it's-, it's I'm it's sorry, like I wasn't, I thought that was like a thumbs up icon, not a hand raise. I apologize, please. Okay, so first I want to congr congratulate uh, Professor Kapner for the book. And um, um, only, uh, it would be great to have your view about uh, the future strategy of uh, the US uh, to the Middle East uh, related to this isolationism and multilateralism and not uh, connected to any of the, the, the new guy that uh, will get into the White House, either it be Trump or uh, Biden. Thank you. Okay, why don't we finish up? Thank you very much. I apologize for not realizing you're trying to ask a question. Charlie, over to you for your, oh, so we've got Dan Andy's actually. Got his hand up. Yeah, hold on one second. Let's, let's go to Dan and then we'll finish up with Charlie. Please, Dan. 
I don't have anything profound to say. I was just gonna say, I agree that Charlie that, um, and with you that we're really reliant on a large number of stylized facts that sort of just creep into the common sense of our work that are just wrong. Um, and we're all guilty of that. And part of that is that we're not historians, but part of that is I think a process of reproduction of those stylized facts and their circulation between policy and academic work. Uh, the kind of question I had, Charlie, I guess is, um, um, uh, I, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more because when I think about the debates about isolationism and you, your, converse, your comments were brief, I'm sure this is handled more in the book, I think largely about the use of the term as a kind of, uh, as a way of, of kind of ruling out of debate uh, the question of not committing abroad to certain kinds of regions. Um, and the way that sort of in a sense that, you know, it, it became a kind of a cudgel in the post-war period. And I know that you, you talk a fair amount about that, but I'm wondering whether or not um, a move towards a more realistic understanding of isolationism or a move away from, from the term entirely towards a debate over what commitments and where commitments, whether that whether that's something that, that you think is even kind of really possible uh, given the way these discourses tend to play out in the policy arena. Can I sneak in the question before the, before the end? Of sure, go ahead, Chuck, please. Chuck, you're muted. Oh, yep, you're muted. Am I muted now? Is. You're good I'm now. Now, go ahead. <clears throat> the issues that most concern me are the ones that uh, that require a, a globalist view: climate, nuclear, pandemics, information, that sort of thing. I'd like to hear more about how you think those can be handled if we're if we're retreating from our internationalist um, outlook. Great, over to you to finish this up, Charlie. Sure, uh, three, three good uh, questions uh, offer. Um, I think that the, that the retrenchment from the Middle East that has started under Trump will continue, no matter who wins the election. Uh, and I, I find it quite instructive that Trump has spent most of this last year basically saying, I'm getting out of Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan. Uh, and he's delivering despite the fact that his Pentagon and his national security team keep saying no. In fact, his withdrawal from Northern Syria occurred because he got so frustrated. He would say, we're leaving, and John Bolton would say, no, we're not. And he would say, we're leaving, and the Pentagon, Mattis, would say, no, we're not. So one day he hangs up the phone with Erdogan and just tweets, we're leaving. Uh, and, and so there's, there's this kind of chaos taking place because there's a president who wants out and a national security bureaucracy that doesn't want to get out. But I think the writing is on the wall. And I would point out that the democratic platform calls for retrenchment from the Middle East and the end of policies of regime change. And if Biden wins, you can bet that there will be some representatives of the progressive wing of the party in his cabinet and in his inner circle. And so I think th th that's the trend line. Uh, I don't, that do, to me doesn't mean disengagement. It means the end of land wars. And most of what the United States wants to do in the region, whether it's contain Iran, keep the flow of oil going, hit terrorists on occasion, help Israel defend itself, that does not require, you know, uh, five, 10,000 troops in Iraq. It requires good diplomacy, standoff platforms, and an infrastructure uh, that already exists. So, uh, uh, and this to some extent brings me to, to Chuck's question. I, you know, when, uh, when I talk about the diminishing appetite for internationalism, I'm referring specifically to war and the projection of military force and the maintenance of strategic commitments. In my mind, if we are easing off on that, we need to lean in to the multilateral engagement. And so everything that you just mentioned in your question, Chuck, whether it's you know, the pandemic issue or the climate change issue or cyber, that, that it doesn't require us to have 200,000 troops stationed here, there, and everywhere. It's much more about teamwork. 
And one of the things that I worry about moving forward is that if the Biden team comes in, they, they sort of go back to a, they have a restoration strategy where we're gonna go back to working with our Atlantic partners and we're gonna build a community of democracies to deal with these issues. Well, that's not gonna work because we've got countries like China and Russia that have a lot to say on these issues. And so it seems to me that we need to have a, a, a way forward on working with, with not just our democratic partners, but countries that matter on these core issues. Finally, uh, Dan, you, you, know, you raise a, a really powerful question in the sense that isolationism is a loaded word. And uh, I, I went back and forth in my mind about whether to, to, you know, should I even use that word? Should the book be called isolationism? In the end, I, I, I chose to do so. And part of my purpose is to rehabilitate the concept of strategic detachment in part because as you rightly said, it's become a cudgel. And when anybody talks about uh, retrenchment, lightening the load, whatever, somebody stands up and says, he's an isolationist, he's an appeaser, Music, Munich, 1938, here we go again. That's completely destructive. And unfortunately right now, our national debate is kind of bipolar. There's the kind of Pax Americana, liberal internationalist, pedal to the metal. And then there's John Mearsheimer and Stephen Walt and the Quincy Institute that are calling up basically to kind of pull out and become an offshore balancer. Um, in my view, where we ought to head is right in between those two positions. And we need to learn the lessons of the isolationist era, good and bad. And we need to learn the lessons of the internationalist era, good and bad, put those lessons together and find the middle ground between doing too much and doing too little, which we've never done in American history. We've either had this isolationist thing going on or we've wanted to run the world. And now it seems to me we're gonna have to learn to live comfortably in a world that may not be the one that we like, but it's the one that we have. Uh, and that I think is, is gonna be uh, the task that, that faces whoever wins this election and the elections after that. All right, I think that's a great place to stop our talk today. Thank you, Charlie, congratulations on the book. Thank you, Jamie, for all of your comments and thank you everyone for joining us today. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Kate, thanks, Jamie. You're welcome.